Today, let's take our Bibles, and we're going to turn together to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, the 19th Psalm, please, the 19th Psalm, where our text is found. As we begin in the 19th Psalm and we think about God's great creation, we think about what happened to that creation. This morning in Sunday school, I made a statement about the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. I'm an old-fashioned, Bible-believing, independent, fundamental Baptist. And I believe... That should have gotten a host of amens, folks. <clears throat> Rewind. Let's say that again. I am an old-fashioned, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist. Amen. Amen. And as such, I believe that we have the literal account of creation and what happened thereafter in, in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. This is a backdrop to what we're reading in just a moment in Psalm 19. I believe that creation is literal. But following creation, there came, of course, corruption because of sin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we have creation, we have corruption, we have condemnation, and then we have the history of mankind. And every dispensation of time is marked by some dark time, some, some time of judgment that God brings because of confusion. Man is perpetually in a state of confusion until he comes to know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the history of mankind. These are troubling times. These are difficult times. Now, people will go all kinds of directions with what I just said. But I want to give it to you in a biblical manner so that everyone here can take it home and do something with it. A lot of people do what, like one lady. They go to extremes. There was an 85-year-old woman. Anybody here 85? All right, Miss Fran, I'm not talking about you. All right. I'm talking about another 85-year-old. There was an 85-year-old woman and her kids got concerned about her being out and about, driving and so forth. They thought maybe she might have difficulty driving, might be in an accident, might not be able to handle it. Uh, they worried about her security. And so they sat down and had a talk with her, hoping to convince her to give up her car keys. Now, most 85-year-olds don't take kindly to those kinds of family meetings. How many of you have been through those? Say amen. Amen. They don't take kindly to those kinds of meetings. In fact, instead of having the result that they hoped that it would, her giving up her car keys, instead something entirely different occurred. She decided to go out and exercise her Second Amendment rights. And she purchased something. I don't know what she purchased. If it was a 38 Special or if it was a Glock, a 9mm, or if it was even a Dirty Harry, you know, handgun of some kind. But I think she bought a big purse to put it in and conceal it. And she said, I'm okay now. I'm going to take care of myself. And you're going to see where this story goes. She felt confident. She felt like she could take care of the problem. Now, whatever might arise, she was okay because she was armed and protected. She thought this was a good thing. She came out of the store. She'd done a little early Christmas shopping. And there in the car were three young men. And they were slamming doors. And they were in the car. And they were, and they were making a ruckus. And most of us folks, most of us folks would not stand for that. And this 85-year-old woman who had just exercised her Second Amendment rights was not going to stand for that. And so what she did was she went out there. She opened up that purse. She pulled out that, that thing that she had bought. 
And she pointed it through the window and she said, get out of that car right now. And they all went like this. And they got out of the car and boom, 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 all three of them, three opposite directions, like scared rabbits, ran away. And she thought to herself, I didn't even have to pull the trigger. Man, the crowd had gathered. They were watching, watching this little old lady. She put it back in her purse. She slid under the wheel. She pulled out her keys. They wouldn't fit. It wasn't her car. She had just become an 85-year-old unintentional carjacker. That's not the way to take control of your life, folks. That's not it. When we look around and we see things that are so seemingly out of control, the first thing we need to do is take a look up. As it says on the front of your bulletin, creation testifies. The heavens declare the glory of God. Inside your bulletin, I have written the same God who holds all of creation in His powerful hands, holds us in His hands and in His heart. And that's it. I want you to go away with this message today that you can apply. This mighty God that we're describing is big enough to control the entire universe and yet He can live within your heart and life and make a very great difference. C.S. Lewis is best known for his books, his chronicles of Narnia and so forth. But he said some very good things. And one thing that C.S. Lewis said is there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God. It's all claimed by God. How does that apply to you and to me? I'll tell you how it applies. There is nothing that is ours. There is nothing that we have the ultimate say over. There is no place we can go where we say, that's just mine and nobody else's. Because the earth is the Lord's. God is in control of everything in this old universe. And the scripture tells us, as we have read today, In Psalm 19, God has recorded His glory upon the parchment of the heavens. Dr. Richard Lee has said, I stand in wonder and awe at what God has written on the heavens. Now that's undeniable. You cannot spend any time in God's creation with an open mind and an open heart and not believe that He is the God of the universe. In fact, I want you to think about it. I was talking to my mother on the phone last night. I have a weekly phone call with her. She's going to be just 102 uh, in the month of January. I said, Mom, I want you to think about this. God gave us everything we have. And everything we are has God's fingerprints on it. God gave us our mind. God gave us our strength. God gave us our abilities. And yet people will use their mind, their strength, and their abilities, misusing it to disbelieve in the very God who provided these. They will sin against the very God who gave them all of these. The very God who gave us a mind, we will doubt Him with that mind. The very God who gave us strength will use that strength to violate His laws. I'm telling you right now, this is vital. This is important for us to understand. We owe God everything because He owns everything. We owe God everything because He has provided redemption for all of us. And it is ingratitude of the highest sort, of the basest sort, For an individual not to accept God's sweet invitation to salvation. It says in Psalm 19, as you've turned there with me, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, 
and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. In those six verses, we have given, been given a very complete summary of God being in charge of everything. You don't have to go out like that 85-year-old woman and try to take control of your situation. God's in control of your situation. And as we read the rest of the chapter, the 19th chapter of the book of Psalms, the rest of it tells us that we can come to know that God through His law, through the Word of God, not only through His world, His creation, but also through His Word. Now I want you to put it down so that you can give every man an answer. You can answer when people ask you about what we believe. Why do we believe that He is God of the universe? Alright, put it down. Number one, because He's our first cause, God. Now the terminology, first cause, is that which is used. Say, first cause. First cause. Boys, say, first cause. First cause, that's right. He is the first cause. He is the first cause. That means if you rewind history and go all the way past recorded history, all the way past the creation, all the way past what you're left with is God, the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God. Now I can't wrap my brain around that. I'm not capable of conceiving of that. I've taught the kids in five o'clock hour, the little boys and girls, when people teach them otherwise and teach them to doubt creation and tell them that evolution is the way and tell them that creation and believing in God, the triune God, is too difficult for their mind. They are to say, they're to reply, my mind may not be big enough to conceive of it, but my heart is big enough to believe it. And I believe what the Bible says. God said it. That settles it. That's it. I believe it. He is our first cause God. I would say to anybody who doubts or disbelieves in God, how did it start? You say, I don't know. I don't know. And they come up with all kinds of speculation for which there is no science, for which there is no evidence whatsoever. And they will speculate. They'll say, well, it all kind of started with one little thing about the size of a marble. And it exploded outward. The Big Bang. And I would say I agree with the Big Bang. But the Big Bang is not how it started. The Big Bang is how it's going to end. Everything's going to fervently melt according to what Peter writes to us. He tells us this present earth and the present heaven will have a day when they will pass away and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. No, I believe in the God of the universe because He's our first cause God. Number two, I believe in the God of the universe because He is our creator God. You say, now how is that different from first cause? Very different. You see, creator describes not only that He created, but how He created. If you read with me in Genesis chapter 1, let's go there. In verse number 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the Hebrew order of the words in that verse, God is first. God should be in the beginning. God in the beginning. And the word create is the same as a word that means out of nothing. Bara means created from nothing. He created a whole lot of things and then sometimes He would take and form that. As in the case of man. He took from the dust, the dirt, just the, the plain old ground, the earth. And he formed man and breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living soul, the scripture says. He is the creator who creates out of nothing. He is the creator who creates with a personal touch. Creates with design. Creates out of nothing. A scientist thought that he could create a man like God created man. And uh, they had a running discussion about this. A Christian 
and an unsaved scientist. And the scientist said, no, I can find in the earth all of the elements that are in a human being. And so if you give me, uh, I, can, I can take some dirt and I can do like God. I can create a man. And the Christian said, no, you can't. He said, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. You've got to make your own dirt first. And that's what we say to the lost today. You've got to make your own dirt first. If you're going to create like God, you've got to start with something. And that something is what God already made. And praise God for it. He is the Creator who created with design. He created with purpose. Every boy and every girl and every young person and every adult who is here today is created by design with a purpose in mind. God's got a plan. He is our first cause, God. You can't go back any further than God. He is our Creator, God. The one who creates out of nothing. The one who, who did so uh, with design and with purpose in each of our cases. Number three. I believe in the God of the universe because He is a caretaker God. He's a caretaker God. And I don't mean to demean Him by calling Him a caretaker, but He is a sustainer of the universe. If He were the God of the deist, He would create everything, set it in motion, go off the far corner of the universe and party. But He didn't do that. He's right here with us. He's in control of what's going on. He holds everything the way it needs to be held and keeps everything the way it needs to be kept and He guards everything the way it needs to be guards, guarded and uh, He continues everything the way it needs to be continued. He is the sustainer. He is the, the caretaker. He's not an absentee God. He's right on top of it. He's right here. And that is personal. I can call on Him. He's right here all the time. He's as near as my next breath. He's as near as my prayer. He's close to me. He is the first cause God. He is the creator God. He is the caretaker God. And then I would say number four, He's the God of the universe because He's the compassionate God. We would not know anything about true love were it not for God. We would know about physical love. We would know about brotherly love. But we would not know about heavenly love were it not for our heavenly God. He is the author of it. He is the one that the Bible declares that God is love. I can't love and you can't love like God can unless God's love is first in us. And thank God that He's a compassionate God. Because He's a compassionate God, that's why He is doing all the other things that He does. That's why His attributes all make sense. God is love. He cares about you more than I can tell you. And then number five, I believe in the God of the universe who is the first cause God. He's the creator God. He is the caretaker God. He is the compassionate God. He is also the capable God. He is competent and capable. God can do anything but fail. God can do anything but fail. He can do anything that's in agreement with His perfect will. He can do anything that is in agreement with His perfect character. That's why when we speak of Him, we use the Prefix omni. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. The word omni means all. He is all powerful, all present. He is all knowing. He is the all powerful, all knowing, all present one. And he is competent. There's nothing he can't handle. He can take care of it. And praise God for that. That's what I've got. That's the kind of God I believe in. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. He's the one I worship. He's the one I serve. I want to take a moment and tell you how good God is and how much He's blessed me and how much He's done for me and for my family. I thank God every day. But as much as we might proclaim it, God's creation speaks loudly and teaches us about our God and teaches us about ourselves. The knowledge that we have is confirmed then by Scripture. God intends for us to enjoy His creation. You know how I know that? Because God enjoys His creation. It says that He looked at everything He had created. The last verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible says, He looked at everything that He had made and He said, It's good. It's very good. God created everything to enjoy it. And so we can enjoy it too. Have you ever thought about it? Why it's beautiful? Say, so, well, it's beautiful because it looks beautiful. You and I 
are looking at a fallen creation through fallen eyes. So what's beautiful? It's beautiful because God enjoys it and created it for that purpose. You see, God has given us every good gift and every perfect gift. And that makes everything that God does beautiful. And everything He's given us is beautiful. It doesn't just have to look good. If it's only beautiful, guys, gals, because it looks good, guess what? It's going to get old. It's going to, it's going to break down. It's going to not look the same in 50 or 100 or 200 years. So what makes something or someone beautiful? That God enjoys it or him or her. That's what makes a person beautiful. So to, to make ourselves beautiful, we make ourselves available to God. We say the God who created all of this, that created the beautiful sunrise that I watched this morning, who created that beautiful seascape and landscape that you looked at this week, who created everything that is that you enjoy in the sky and on the ground and all around. That God wants to enjoy you and me too. And we can be beautiful if we find His perfect will. Success is knowing and doing the will of God. You can discover it in the Word of God. We see God's wonders all around us, beneath us, within us. We have a creation it does more than imply that there is a Creator. It tells us clearly. It's, it screams. It tells us clearly there is a God who loves us, cares about us, is watching over us. He's the great, all-powerful, loving One. And He desires us to be in His perfect will. The creation is not eternal. Only God and that which has to do with God is eternal. There's an end to the creation. And I really can't wrap my brain around that. Like, this is all of creation and God can step outside of it? Absolutely! I believe that because He is eternal. He is incomprehensible. That's why our brains, which are geared and wired for this plane, for this world, don't take in all that there is outside of our world. What appears to be virtually endless is not. Though we could never, at the speed of light, pass all the way across the universe. We can barely, I mean, our galaxy is huge and there are billions throughout the universe. It's all calibrated. It's all balanced. It's all perfect. And God did it. And He does it. He contains and sustains life. He is personal. And so it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8, we're told where we fit into all of this. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name over all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. We think we're so bright, we're so smart. But God says that through very basic things and situations He is proclaimed. And, and those that claim to be super intelligent are made to look foolish. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, like our text. What is man? Here's the question. That thou art mindful of him. And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. That's us. And hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. You read that in Genesis 1 and 2. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. And uh, you know, we should have figured out from the Bible so many things. The circle of the earth instead of believing in a flat earth. We should have figured out that there are sea currents from this verse. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. I was reading and I found 
this from Frank Peretti. Now, he wrote mostly about inner space, about demons and challenges and so forth. But we shouldn't be surprised that he writes about outer space and what creation teaches us. He says, being a bit of a telescope enthusiast, I sat up late on many a chilly night and marveled at, at, at all those brilliant little marbles, faraway diamonds and silvery smudges. My mind boggled by the beauty, unable to comprehend the size, wondering at the time it took for those images to travel to my retinas. And let me tell you, long time. Does it make me feel small? Now here it is. When we talk about the enormity, the, the incomprehensible uh, size of the creation, here's the answer. Does it make me feel small? Well... Not so much as it makes me feel safe. Next time you look up and you see all of that, that should make you feel safe. He goes on to say, You see, I know their Maker, capital M on Maker, and when I consider what mind and power are holding it all together, I'm comforted to know whose plan it all is and that He has made me a chosen part of it. I want you to put your palm up like this. Put your palm up like this. Now put your other palm over it like that. And that's where God's got us. He's got us right there. Is that safe or what? I'm safe in God's mighty hands. God is controlling. I don't need to be in control. Max Lucado has said, you need a Yahweh. That's the way to pronounce Jehovah. He says, you need a God who can place 100 billion stars in our galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe. You need a God who can shape two fists of flesh into 75 to 100 billion nerve cells, each with as many as 10,000 connections to other nerve cells, place it in a skull and call it a brain. You need a God who can come in the soft of night and touch you with the tenderness of April snow. In your bulletin, we place these quotes, one by Sheila Walsh. When life becomes overwhelming, I step outside and lift my gaze to the heavens. For I am convinced that the God who holds the stars in place will hold us through this night. Preacher, that's what I need. I need a Yahweh like that. I need a Jehovah God like that that will wrap His arms of love around me and hold me tight and keep me safe. When the doctor comes back with the report, he says, you know those symptoms that troubled you? It's cancer. It's cancer. And there's going to be a certain procedure you're going to have to go through. And it's going to be painful and difficult and and uh, you might make it or you might not make it, but, but that's the truth. When that report comes, that's when you need the God who put those billions of stars in those billions of galaxies. That's when you need Him to be personal, to come and love you. That's when you need Him to come and tell you it's going to be okay and whisper that comfort in your ear and in your heart. Someone has said, it was Kirk Cameron, I believe, when I come to die, I want someone there with me who's stronger than death. I want to walk through the door of eternity with the creator of the universe, life incarnate, God who became man, died for me, defeated the grave, and calls me his friend. That's what we want. That's what we need. And today, I'm thinking about the person that came in here, and only you know what I'm talking about. But you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know what you need. You know down inside. You need God to wrap His arms of love around you. He's in control. He loves you. You need to give yourself. You need to give your today and your tomorrow and everything in your life to Him because He's in control and He cares about you, my friend. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before He voluntarily 
gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this, Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.